Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And it's really a delight to welcome you here for the first Policy Talks at the Ford School lecture for this, which is our 100th year. We are very honored to be joined today by Alejandro Castillo Cuellar. And um, it's a great pleasure for us to have him here. Um, he has traveled from his post as the chair of the Department of Anthropology at Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, to deliver today's <coughs> lecture. And bienvenido a Anaver. My Spanish used to be better, I must okay. say. Um, and uh, so excuse my mispronunciations, um, if so. But we're delighted to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I'll have the opportunity to introduce Alejandro more fully in just a moment, but I did want to just give um, a couple of, uh, of minutes on how special it is and how remarkable it is to have him here in particular for this first policy talks during our centennial year. For the past 100 years, our school has trained students to, tra to study local as well as global issues. And as you may not know, our first international students matriculated in 1925. Um, one of them was from the Philippines, and two of them were from China. Sometimes I, I do wonder, as we think a lot about our community now today, I do wonder what their experience was like and how they felt being part of our very closely connected small community as a um, few of a very small international student group. But they did come, and they studied, and they graduated. And I ho hope they made some wonderful friendships along the way. After they graduated, they went back to their home countries to serve the public. One of them went on to represent his district in the national legislature. Another one served as a mayor of a vibrant economic trading port. Well, these days, as you can see, um, we're much, much more diverse, and we're really proud of our diversity. Our public policy students hail from 14 different nations at the moment, and they enrich our program in so many ways with their perspectives, their personal experiences, their passions, and all that they bring to the Ford School. About a quarter of Ford School students intern outside of the United States each year, and about another 20% intern with a US-based organization that deals with international issues. And I can say that it is in many ways truly a much, much more global community, and I hope a more welcoming community, with far more understanding of international issues and a deep thirst to understand those issues better. And so we've really been enthusiastically awaiting Alejandro's visit and this lecture this afternoon. I should mention that his visit would not have been possible without the tireless work of our friend and colleague, Yazir Henry, who is here with us in the front, who is an eminent human rights scholar, of course, in his own right, who came here to the Ford School and has from South Africa and has been part of our community since 2007. I should also mention that today's policy talks is named for Joshua Rosenthal. Josh was a 1979 graduate of the University of Michigan. He spent his senior year here at our school before going on to earn a master's in public policy from Princeton. Josh was passionate about world affairs, and he worked in the field of international finance. He died in the attacks on the World Trade Center on September 11th in 2001. Josh's mother, Marilyn Rosenthal, was a longtime Michigan faculty member, and it was very important for her to shape positive meaning out of what happened on 9-11, and to honor her son's optimism about the world and his understanding of how mutual understandings, dialogue, and analysis can improve communities both in the United States and beyond our borders. And that really was where this lecture series was born. Marilyn and others established the Josh Rosenthal Education Fund, which enables the Ford School to encourage new and deeper understandings of international issues. I know that Josh's aunt, Harriet Burke, is here in the audience today. We're delighted to have her with us. And um, Josh's cousin, Suzanne Waller, is watching the event via live web stream. So we're very grateful for your family's ongoing support. And it's really, truly an inspiration for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Marilyn Rosenthal died in 2007, but I know she would have been so pleased to see the Ford School welcome world-renowned international human rights scholar Alejandro Castellano Cuellar. Referring to him as world-renowned is not just honorific. He has taught in many prominent universities in the United States, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Latin America, and in Africa and so has, uh, has really um, been engaged in communities all over the world. In 2006, he was awarded the Stanley Diamond Memorial Award in Social Sciences, and in 2010, the Angel Escobar Foundation Award in the Social Sciences. His research interests focus on the anthropology of violence, and his expertise in this difficult area has been sought by several world governments. In 2002, he was a consultant to the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and in 2010, to the Colombian National Commission for Reparation and Reconciliation and the Historical Memory Group. He was also charged with the task of writing the official proposals on behalf of the National Conference of Victims of Forced Disappearances to the Peace Processes in Havana and his extraordinary work with communities' testimonies to violence in Colombia and abroad inform the lecture that we will hear today. He expressed his eagerness to take questions from the audience following his remarks, and at around 4.40, our staff will be walking through the aisles to collect the cards. I hope that all of you received a card and enc encourage you to put questions that you have for Alejandro to be um, to be picked up there. Yazir Henry will select questions along with two of our students, um, Patricia Padilla and Juliana Pino. So welcome to them as well. Both Patricia and Juliana have lived and studied in Colombia, which is our speaker's home, and will help to facilitate the Q&A session. If you're watching online, uh, please submit your questions via Twitter and use the hashtag policy talks. And so, with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Alejandro to the podium. Looks like. Hello. Well, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank the organizers, uh, Dean Collins, uh, uh, my colleague and friend, Jasir Henry, whom I know for some time now, and I'm happy to, as we say, recognize and acknowledge this friendship of uh, intellectual character as well. And the school in general for the opportunity to talk and to be honored to be here as well. <clears throat> it's been a while since I haven't, since I spoke English last time, so please excuse my my, uh, yeah, my, my accent, I mean, I'm not any more ashamed of my accent, but sometimes I just. So for today, I had this kind of question. I was thinking, what could I bring to uh, this table <clears throat> when, I have, uh, when, when, when the problems in Colombia can be so complex and the histories can be so interesting as well? I understand that not everybody here is an expert in this country, so I decided basically to write something that I brought <clears throat> to make it easier for me to develop myself in the argument that I want to make. And basically it has to do with the work that I have been doing with organizations around the country. Thinking in, in now in the country there is an interest in organizing a truth commission. And in my, my sense is based on the experiences that I have had in other parts of the world, a truth commission would require certain, I would say certain changes, certain new types of investigation, certain concepts. So what I, what I brought was the idea of developing the concept, at least, of historical injury, something that I think should be included in this commission if it happens in the end. <clears throat> so what I'm, I will read basically the text. It's a rather short text, I hope. And, uh, and I will tell, we will take questions and we'll do something later on. Uh, so the text is called, I have to take off my glasses, by the way. <clears throat> the text is called On the Politics of Historical Injuries, Colombia's Struggle for Peace and Memory. <clears throat> In this lecture, my voice operates as a resonance device. My intention today is to pose a question as I express a kind of skepticism that I have come to nurture with others, intellectuals, survivors, and activists in many places. I speak not only as a scholar, but also as someone whose family ties and life has been entwined, perhaps in small ways, with the history and politics of my country. 
In this lecture, I would like to provide <clears throat> a few thoughts on the importance, not only in Colombia, but in other national cities as well, of dealing with the structural forms of violence, political conflict, and chronic inequality in times of transitions. I will do so, by, I will do so using a number of vignettes and excerpts from my ethnographic notes in Colombia. In trying to explore these broad topics in recent years, my work has concentrated on the social interactions that emerge as a result of the implementation of a series of laws in the country, particularly the Ley de Justicia y Paz, or Peace and Justice Act, and the Victims Law, the Ley de Victimas. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, my perspective on these legal instances is based on the idea that they create very concrete realms of everyday life that frame and define the meanings of harm, of collective pain, of the past, and I would even say of the future as well. In this regard, when looking at the workings of certain institutional practices, this everyday oscillates between highly ritualized and technical series of procedures implemented by bureaucracies and more informal social spaces where historical narratives are produced, legitimated, and circulated through different channels and technologies of reproduction. In the following five vignettes, I want to delve into the connections between violence and temporality, and into what is unsaid, rendered structurally unspoken or unintelligible in these spaces of the law. But before I turn to them, allow me a brief detour to situate myself. First vignette, and I will just, every time I, I will, every vignette has a title, so I will also, of course, read it. First vignette, fracture and continuity. The ways in which societies have experienced different forms of violence has been at the forefront of a number of academic and political debates in recent decades. The idea of transitional justice and the complex network of legal and extra-legal mechanisms for dealing with the causes and effects of human rights violations is based on at least two basic assumptions from my point of view. On the one hand, it is grounded in the promise and the prospect of what I called an imagined new nation. And secondly, it is also grounded in the very possibility of assigning violence a place behind, behind, relegating it to re reclusion of the past. In other words, as, society, as societies move forward, violence is left behind. This liminal space where societies seem to break time between the old and the new is a kind of betweenness. In a kind of betweenness is where the social imagination of the future begins to take shape. However, in countries where political conflict, conflict, structural and long-standing economic inequalities have determined people's life, this promise poses a series of critical questions. Is it possible to think of transitions as a kind of quote-unquote continuity with the past rather than the rupture in which they are often presented? How can these continuities be identified and how do they determine the fate of politics in the present? In other words, how can chronic hunger or historical injustices be healed if that is possible? In this sense, critics of, trans of this transitional paradigm have pointed out the difficulties of conceiving the prospect of a post-violence future in countries where political and economic hegemonies have been and continue to be historically rooted. How can a sustainable peace be accomplished if, as in Colombia, the historical and structural causes of internal conflict remain unresolved? Could this situation constitute the seedbed, seedbed for future conflicts? It seems, to me that the, it seems to me that identifying these tensions is essential not only to understanding the possibilities of a long-term peace, but also to grasping how individuals and broader communities interconnect larger historical processes and personal experiences in an effort to create a future. As an anthropologist, <clears throat> I explore these questions in Colombia from the perspectives of the daily workings of this paradigm and these mechanisms. 
In fact, I study the social spaces and their legal, geographic, productive, and even sensory devices that come as a product of the application of what I call, generally speaking, laws of national unity and reconciliation. These social spaces are characterized by a series of ensemble of institutional practices, expert knowledge, and global discourses that interact in a particular social world, in a particular social and historical context to deal with gross violations of human rights. I compound all of these issues under the idea of transitional scenario. It is precisely the tensions between fracture and continuity and the technological process through which the old and the new emerge in a particular juncture that interests me the most. In these spaces, certain experiences of victimhood, of survival, become unintelligible by the current institutional discourses. This is what I would like to highlight today. As I speak with victims around the country as part of my work, I realize that when facing the unimaginable, unimaginable tomorrow, sorry for the complication here, as a society, we inhabit a kind of illusion. When I say illusion, I mean the following. In English, the etymology of the noun illusion evokes, evokes deceit, deception, due to a fantastic plan or desire, a false perception, or a trick of the senses. Uh, hence, the term illusionist, someone who performs a trick to devise the eye. However, in other languages, like Spanish or Italian or French, illusion, when used as a verb, ilusionarse would say in Spanish, singular or ilusionarnos, plural, also evokes the act of building one's hopes up or entertaining or harboring expectations and getting excited about something like a future plan, a project, a new situation. Depending on the narrative context of a particular turn of phrases, its meaning is closer to the idea of an expectation created by the prospect of new possibilities and realities. It revolves around, more around the prospect of forward-looking perspective rather than the deceitful, deceitful phantom-like aspect of an illusion. Here, I retain both of these connotations, blending the Latin etymologies, the ambiguities, and the simultaneous sense of fracture and continuity associated with its uses in other languages. Now, it seems to me that in Colombia, as the negotiation process advances in Havana, we face the possibility of ilusionarnos. As the discussion of historical reconstruction and memory is in, on the negotiating table at this point. The process seems to be moving forward. In fact, a truth commission investigating not only the fate of the disappeared and the assassinated, but also the historical responsibility of the state or guerrillas will be the most likely future scenario. And I hope so. However, in this context, I am more interested in highlighting how certain victims, forms of victimhood, problematize the dividing line of the old and the new, one of the illusions in times of transitions. I will do so then now in the following two sections, or vignettes. First, I want to recall the story of an indigenous woman and acknowledge the possibility of rethinking the connections between violence and temporality. Secondly, I will explore how structural forgetfulness was inscribed on the procedures of the justice and peace process. Now, an excerpt from the field notes I took in Colombia in order to develop the idea of historical injuries. Second vignette, the ethics of listening. Julia's story. I gathered fragments of her life during a series of interviews and conversations I conducted between 2001 and 2013 as part of a larger research project on the impacts of the Justice and Peace Act. I want to unravel as I listen to bits and pieces of her, of her life, the semantic density of the words used by this indigenous woman in order to highlight the existence of forms of violence that lie beyond the conceptual architectures put in place by official truth-seeking mechanisms. In general, I am concerned with the ways violence is mediated through language, 
not only the mediations embodied by a survivor's testimony, but also the mediations established by the institutional procedures. The conversation in question echoes other voices and other encounters I have had in recent years with people who have shared their experiences of terror with me. She has allowed me to relate her story today. And I open quote in this case. Julia is a married woman. She initially had two children, Paula and Leon, who is 15 years old and suffers from leukemia. Several years ago, when she was 27, Julia and her daughter Paula, who was only five years old at the time, were raped by paramilitaries somewhere in the southern parts of the country. Julia became pregnant as a result of the rape and was so desperate that she thought of having an abortion at one point. But eventually she gave, to a, she gave birth to a baby girl who is now nine years old. Who re, sorry, nine years old. As, as could be expected, Julia feels all kinds of ambiguities with regards to the child who, remains, who reminds her of the abuse she suffered. Life and death coexist together for Julia since Clara's birth, for the baby was, in more than one sense, an unwanted human being. On the other hand, her son had an incurable disease. In a different way, life and death also coexisted in his body. Julia ran away after the rapist threatened her when she took the case to the police before she knew she was pregnant, a decision which turned out to be a fatal mistake. She later abandoned her husband and was forced to move to the dusty southern outskirts of Bogota's endless loca localities, slum neighborhoods, that filled the hilly landscape, barely observable from the privileged parts of the city sometimes. She still lives there in a, tiny, in a tiny, hidden away space and feeds her children by selling cigarettes on an urban bus at 10 US cents apiece. Her husband eventually found her and discovered that she had given birth to a child who, had, who he embraced in times of one of his own. However, Julia still lives today in abject chronic poverty. One day, a close friend of Julia told me laconically, and I open quotes, the problem in Colombia, paradoxically, is that the state, state has no way to repair this woman's life. There is no mechanism to repair this person's life, end quote. Last time I asked about Julia, a neighbor told me her sick youngster was into drugs and gangs. It seems she decided to run away I'm sorry, it seems she decided to return to the South, but it looks like she hasn't been able to, the woman said. Third vignette, violence and temporality. <clears throat> Julia's history is indeed a series of profound tragic events. Her experience is an example of sexualized power exerted over an indigenous woman by men carrying guns, an example of her body quite literally taken as a territory of war. And her personal subjectivity as a battle trophy in the context of so-called armed conflict. Of course, there are institutional programs devised to accompany rape victims. However, her situation is, as an indigenous leader once told me, more broadly the product of a larger history a wider temporality that exceeds current debates and technocratic approaches to memory, to reparations and justice. Hers is the story of the exclusion and historical inequality of indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities in this country. Her body is a repository of this palimpsest. Inequality is the product of economic exploitation and the exploitation of difference too. <clears throat> Julia inhabits a form of victimization that, however immediate and concrete, falls beyond the legal epistemologies that inform and even determine the debates in Colombia on the nature of violence itself. Her experience speaks more to forms of violence that are not perceived as such, and therefore cannot be repaired, either because they are situated by the current political establishment in a remote, 
neutralized past, or because they are subtly dressed in the robes of national unity and reconciliation that force a society to look to the future, quote unquote, to return, to turn the page, quote unquote, and to leave the past behind, quote unquote. However, bodies and subjectivities emaciated by the daily carvings of permanent and systemic need reminds us of an ever-present past. <clears throat> In short, her story is that of an is that of an indigenous woman living in a situation of chronic misery, embodying chronic silence, I would say. In part, the tragedy was not only the sexual abuse, with all the destruction that this conveys, of course, but also the structural conditions that allow the abuse to happen in the first place as well. Rape has been historically chronic. The kind of violence she embodies are so multifarious localized in a set of multiple spaces, geographical, geographical, bodily, imaginary, existential, and sensorial, and temporalities simultaneously in the historical colonial past and the ever-present past that in Colombia the state, employing the current discourse on healing, does not know how to repair. That was a long phrase. <clears throat> in the end, how is chronic hunger repaired? Yes. Thank you. Oof. Thank you. In the end, how is chronic hunger repaired? In other words, how can the violence of structures, I'm sorry, how can the violence that structures every day or the everyday, almost to the point of being rendered invisible, be healed. Furthermore, is it possible co to conceive of a violence that simultaneously structures and destructures the realm of the everyday existence? Might it be possible to speak of harm as an accum accumulative phenomenon over the course of centuries, for example, a kind of existential palimpsest in which layers of collective suffering entwine? In this context, and from the viewpoint of historical, historically destitute communities in Colombia or South Africa or Central America, for whom violence is grounded in longer temporalities, in a certain register do not necessarily experience transitions as ruptures. In fact, for, for them, it represents a, chap a different chapter in the history of violence of civilization in which land expropriation, cultural and literal genocide the di by different mechanisms, and the theft of wealth and strategic resources speak of a continuum rather than a cleavage. To what extent do these injuries also become historical erasures? How do they both play out in the politics of the present? Fourth vignette, bureaucracy and testimony. Now, how are these historical silences produced in the present? How do they become institutionalized even when truth-seeking mechanisms like the ones triggered by the Ley de Justicia y Paz or, or Justice and Peace Law are implemented? Let me now turn to the technical certification of harm in Colombia as a way to delve further ethnographically into the previous questions. In 2005, the law 975, or the law of justice and peace law, the legal framework in charge of administering the demobilization of members of paramilitary groups was implemented. I am not interested in commenting on such a complex process at this point, except to say that according to the law, members of paramilitary groups would obtain, quote, legal benefits or reduce sentences in exchange for admitting their criminal acts. At the beginning of the justice and peace process, the admission, the, these admissions were rendered by way of a procedure known as free depositions or more literally, free versions, versiones libres in Spanish, in which paramilitaries tell the National Prosecuting Authority their versions of events, mainly all types of criminal acts. In the end, the voice of perpetrators played center stage 
and in some cases trigger low-level corroboration mechanisms. As a scholar, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to observe one of the procedures established by the law. One in particular, a special investigation commission consisting of a team of forensic investigators, criminal profilers, topographers, representatives from the Fiscalia or National Prosecution Authority, lawyers, army special forces, officers from the National Penitentiary Institute, and one paramilitary commander whose code name was Alpha. I was an observer playing the role of a forensic historiographer as I turned my own involvement there. The purpose of those of these or those 15 day long traveling commission, which due to serious uh, security risks took almost one year to organize, was to cut across the southern state of Meta from the city of Villavicencio to Puerto Gaitan and Mapiripan, a small town in the south of the country, in order to locate mass graves, to reconstruct the region's historical memory, and to certify the impact of this paramilitarism. I call this process peripatetic memorialization, by the way. Logistically speaking, the commission organized several micro itineraries within the overall activities in the region in order to gather stories of war from different communities. These stories were intended to legally certify the occurrence of violent and criminal incidents and their effects on people's life. A protocol was used to collect information about specific cases. During these encounters, communities were asked to give detailed accounts of events such as the mur murder of a family member. However, what is interesting about this process is that it, it resembled a surgical procedure that allowed some forms of violence to emerge while others disappeared. It implanted, in a way, a structural forgetfulness. In other words, what happens when testimonies cannot be easily classified according to the legal categories established by the Justice and Peace Law? Let me tell you the story of one of such forensic encounters when the Fiscalia or the District Attorney visited the Wakoyo indigenous community as it would help to illustrate this erasure. One afternoon, a representative of the Fiscalia came to the Resguardo, a special autonomous political and administrative unit recognized by the state, and asked for a certain family in order to inquire into the circumstances of their son's death more than a decade ago. To begin, the Fiscalia people had to adapt to the collective performance of this telling. Whereas, whereas they had been expecting a semi-legal face-to-face question and answer interview. The old man, who was the authority figure within the family group, spoke while the other members listened and assented. There was a certain social division of speaking in place in the telling process that the investigators didn't seem to recognize. Thus, a kind of silence was installed during the procedure itself as officially recorded on video, audio, and the protocol, reflecting the person's perspective of history. This was accentuated when the man was asked to speak, in general, of the history of violence. The interviewees he had, the interviewers had the circumstances of his son's killing in their mind, but he centered their narrative on apparently unrelated anecdotal information. The investigating team was, used to, was not used to such extended narratives since they were trained to listen to something entirely different. The three-hour tour de force carried out in a barely audible Spanish rather than in the community's own Piapoco or Sicuani languages tells the story of a systematic displacement and persecutions that they have endured since the time of their grandparents generations before the events they are asked to describe. From the very beginning, his history deviated from the legal categories inherent to the Fiscalia's investigation. Its historical death had nothing to do with the time and the space coordinates implicit in a criminal investigation and are 
and a criminal investigation. These narratives could not be easily translated into, into standard formats designed for collecting information. From the viewpoint of the officials, the witness, quote unquote, spoke too much, a lot, but not the way the interviewees needed to hear. They required concrete legal facts about the ways in which paramilitary operations, massacres, and disappearances affected individuals and their communities. Contrary to what they expected of him, the narrator jumped from one period to the next in a seemingly erratic way, reaching back several decades and infusing the story he was telling with great authority. The elder was, in fact, a very skilled speaker. The community grouped around him as visitors coming from the surrounding area sat down to listen to what he had to say. Dozens of children hover all over the place as many men and women gather to listen in a kind of collective ritual of mutual recognition. Surrounded by the most basic material conditions and obviously anemic children, it is difficult not to see the evidence of chronic and historical poverty. Nevertheless, for the prosecutor leading the inquiry commission, this social setting was almost unintelligible. The elders' narrative did not speak of recent death, murders, or, the, or displacements, although they lurked uh, there in the background. It dealt with historical persecution instead. In fact, when I was looking around the compound, I clearly saw the ever-present traces of this history, the dismal, the dismal living conditions and the abandoned toilets that, that had been donated as, as acts of charity, traces of so-called development projects and promises of a better world. <clears throat> Some officials, however, saw what they imagined to be the meaning of culture, ancestral customs, and even an expression of, quote, primitive nature of these communities in this particular social landscape. Later in the afternoon, in order to speak with greater clarity about paramilitary violence, it was necessary to look for a, quote, expert, quote, specialist from within the community who could speak the language of justice and peace, the language of the state, <clears throat> and who would be able to render this testimony comprehensible to the legal bureaucrats. <clears throat> the story told by the old man was literally beyond the possibility of being put on record since he would not be tabulated and consequently could not be turned into evidence. It is a violence not certifiable. In the end, the psychologist conducting the meeting scratched the following conclusion loosely on the protocol page after listening to another family member recounting the, ca the case. I open quote again. Name of the victim, Alfredo Siquani. Date of event, May 2003. Type of event, picked up by paramilitaries and killed, end quote. The rest of the elder's story was legal, legally irrelevant. For the record, let me say that I understand the importance of clarifying these events, but, it's also, but it is also important to highlight the shortcomings, the structural silences inherent to these procedures. The investigative team required specific information and did everything in its power to cleanse the story and to cleanse the story and the history of allegedly unnecessary biographical narrative or apparently subjective information. What were the connections, what were the connections anyway, one of them asked me, between the persecutions and literal hunting of indigenous communities by large landowners seven decades ago with the murder of their sons few years ago. The nature of the spoken word resulted on comprehensible utterances for the state bureaucrat. It needed to be domesticated. A word or two before I finish on this last term seems necessary, domestication, because I do speak of the domestication of testimonies. As we know, the verb domesticate has a double etymology as well, again. 
Don't, not only does it conjure up the idea of bringing under control or converting animals to domestic use by overpowering them, but also to accustom to home life or to adapt to an environment. The term evokes the possibility of rendering familiar or bringing home into the private family sphere that which is perceived as otherness. Power, control, and homeliness inhabit this term. Of course, in Latin domus and in Greek doma, that's the origin. To domesticate is to render familiar. One of the underlying arguments is what I would, is what I have just described. I'm sorry. One of the underlying arguments in what I have just described is that, broadly speaking, testimonies of victims of violence are brought by way of different mechanisms into the familiar world, but also into domesticity. In other words, experiences, and this is what I would like to stress, are rendered intelligible by the workings of institutional language as power. One way to bring them into confine, to bring them into and confine them to the realm of domesticity is to install an epistemological silence around certain forms of violence that play out in, part play out in particular ways in specific historical experiences. Beyond the specificities of the meeting held during the time of the investigation, the fact is that the justice and peace processes created concrete, historically informed scenarios involving different actors. There may well be a distance between the vision presented by public servants and the experiences of violence, what I again call historic injuries, expressed by an old indigenous man. These experiences are explained by a younger generation of family members who have a greater understanding of the official internationalized language of truth, justice, and reparations. Despite the, despite the surgical extraction of testimony, it still appears to float in the air with no greater meaning other than to illustrate the history of war. What is clear is that a new generation of leaders have emerged, many of whom have already been targeted for persecution, by the way, who have understood and adapted strategically to the language of the state. And final thought. <clears throat> An exploration of the ways words and testimonies inhabit these frameworks requires an examination of how technical processes like the one mentioned above produce and reinforce a series of silences that paradoxically emerge at the very moment of their enunciation in language. During testimony, the semantic density of what is narrated is subject to discursive pressures and, theoretical and the theoretical limitations that define the nature of the word and what is intended to convey. In these pages, I have attempted to understand the pressure by which the truth of the other, the violence imposed on a woman's body or the language of a man's words are trapped in epistemic violence again. Although these lines, along these lines, I have not only dealt with what is frequently uttered or testified in the context of transitional scenarios, but also connected to, uh, to the kinds of absences of spoke, unspoken and uncanny that elude the currently hegemonic tropes of trauma and human rights. Silence is, in its own right, an articulation of experience, and as such, it requires a particular form, form of calibration, sensibility, and engagement from, this, from the listener, perhaps even an ethics of listening. In trying to grasp the multiple dimensions of harm through different mechanisms, certain languages of pain and suffering instituted by state-sponsored laws and their daily workings may fail to render intelligible the structural and the historical dimensions of harm that are at the root, at the root of conflict itself. This implies a series of data collecting practices in which words and testimonies are inscribed and framed. As explained earlier, it is through this domestication that the word of the other is, in a way, made familiar. When concrete forms of, of violence are left out of the archive in its traditional sense, or fall beyond the contours defined by what I have referred to transitional scenario, 
spaces where concepts of victimhood, history, and memory are negotiated, the questions regarding sustainability of peace following internal conflicts emerge. To what extent are they likely to be reasons for future confrontation, the seeds for future violence? Peace is not only laying down arms, it's also taking this temporal scale, this violence of structures of inequality into consideration to move forward at a different society or to a different society. Let me close now with a quote from the latest meeting of the indigenous leaders in Colombia some time ago, and I quote the Taita in this regard. If national and local governments are genuinely interested in contributing by providing fair and constructive reparation, they must begin to recognize that the injury caused to the Aboriginal peoples has occurred over a long period of time and that it is not enough to simply count the number of recent victims or to quantify the cash payments that have been, that have been offered in compensation for the material damage caused. And I want to thank you. That would be all. So how should we proceed now? Hello, can everybody hear me? I'm Juliana Pino. I'm a dual degree student obtaining my Master's of Public Policy in the Ford School and my Master of Science in Natural Resources and Environment. The first question asks, La Ley de Justicia y Paz, what exactly does it do? The Ley of, wow, interesting question. Maybe one should say what it doesn't do or what it, did, it didn't do. It was meant, of course, to be the process through which paramilitaries were going to demobilize. And in the end, I mean, there has been in Colombia, of course, a debate as to whether that is true or not. But it was supposed to produce, on the one hand, to administer this demobilization, and on the other hand, to sort of clarify through the process itself, which included, of course, the foundation of the National Commission for Reparation and other institutions. It was meant to clarify 30 years of paramilitarism. And in fact, to some extent, it did. It did because, as far as I can tell, the National Prosecution Authority has 7,000 DVDs recording paramilitaries speaking of their deeds. That is so much information that I think is almost un impossible to administer. But yet, in the end, despite that, the Justicipas uh, law um, didn't actually make the connection between the responsibility of officials in the state and paramilitaries themselves. So in a way, it's perceived also like an impunity law for many, I mean, for certain organizations in the country. So I think in some ways it, for me personally, it's a revisionist law because in the end, the, the whole architecture of the law impeded the, uh, the, 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 parami the, the military forces to be accused of, bro of violations of human rights. So in a way, it is a revisionist law. So that's why I say, instead of saying what it did, because it did some things, of course, I wonder what it didn't do in the end. And it didn't do is clarify a lot of things of 30 or something more years of paramilitarism and the connection with the state as well. That's a complicated topic, I have to say. <laughs> Um, Alejandro, thank you very much for your uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Patricia Padilla. I'm a second year student of the Master in Public Policy. And our second question is, what is the role that the drug trafficking is playing in the current peace process? And especially, um, what is the role that it will take in a long-term uh, sustainable peace? Well, the role of the drug trafficking in the current peace process, I have no idea. I mean, this, the peace process is supposed to break precisely to, to the, I mean, to take up the issue of drug trafficking. Um, in fact, one of the first, as we say, puntos, one of the first issues that were discussed in Cuba had to do with the idea of illegal uh, agriculture and, 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 and the cultivation of drugs in general. And that has to be seen, I mean, there is not much information about that because the, the process has kept much of the, much of the conversations in reality hidden from, from the public view, and I have no access to that. But certainly, from my point of view, the demobilization of the FARC would imply the necessity of restructuring what happens in the, in the countryside, and most likely they will be working as, I guess, as 
uh, kind of uh, law enforcement people if that in the, at the end works out. I mean, that's the ideal in, the, in, in any case. So it's difficult to say because it also has to be also has to do with the reconstitution of the land owning has to be also with the idea of what is a, a, a what is agriculture in the future of Colombia what would be uh, the role of a different set of uh, of activities in the countryside and that set of activities will be part of the I guess of the of the tensions uh, uh, connected to the drug trafficking and so on uh, to be in a, in a, in a more uh, sort of pessimistic, I think I find it very difficult to, to break uh, somehow to destructure the connections with the drug trafficking and in general because it's, a, it's, it's just a new kind of new structures on, in place now. And we'll see what happens after the process if that ends up. And uh, somebody was asking me yesterday if I was positive or, uh, or with regard to the process. And I always say that after 75,000 people disappear, 50 years of work, I mean, the least I can do is be positive, of course. <clears throat> I try to. Thank you. The next question reads, what do you think the effect of the vote in December regarding amnesty for the perpetrators will be on the memory of the victims? The vote on the, can you explain that question? I don't understand. So the person who asked this question is in the room. I don't know. They Who's here? Clarify. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, was just, I know that the, the vote is happening in December about whether to grant amnesty or to continue to pursue a lot of the perpetrators, and I just want to know, like, how do you think it's going to affect the peace process and, how, and the memory of the victims? The vote in December? Oh, okay. What you the, the law, justice, and peace? I don't know. I, I don't know. There is to be after the process is finished. Uh, some people say one year. I mean, being optimistic, uh, optimistic. Uh, some people say one year after the process is being finished. I mean, the dialogue in Havana, and they come to the conclusion to these points in particular. I mean, there are several points that they are debating in Cuba right now. After that happens, there would be a national, let's say, vote or a national process through which the, pro through which the negotiations in Cuba would be uh, uh, formalized, let's say. I don't know if that is what you mean. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall any voting in December this year, to be honest. I mean, for regard to the justice and peace law, I don't know. I apologize. I have no idea. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, is a Mandela-like approach to reconciliation possible or desirable for Colombia? Well, I, in regards to South Africa, although I lived there for a, a while too, uh, that's an interesting question. I would say that uh, the difference between, I mean, in Colombia there is now two currents. One is a public current, if I can use that term, which is, uh, let's say, interested in peace, interested in, in finishing conflict. And there is also a counter current who is more interested in war, who is people who is willing to go back precisely to the years of, of uh, massacres and so on. And I think that in some ways, and I say this very respectfully, especially for the government, I think we still lack the political leadership that is able to move even the people who is against this process to move it even further forward. I think we lack, in some ways, the leadership of somebody like Nelson Mandela who was able to, and who did it, of course, who was able to put, us, uh, to put it in a light way, to put the country on his back and move it forward. I think we don't have that leadership yet. I think we have a lot of, I mean, Colombia now, it's a con very particular country. You live there, in my case personally, and you have this sense of everything is cool, everything is moving forward, everything is fine. And at the same time, you feel that something is going on underneath that you don't really understand what it is and are the currents of war indeed. And I happen to inhabit in the middle of that. So for me, it's kind of a, a complicated issue. But I, you know, in, in the question with regards to Mandela, 
I just think, I mean, these are different contexts, different histories, different conceptions of violence as well. One thing is paramilitarism in, in collusion with the state. One is uh, natural resources, petroleum, gold, and something else is South Africa, racism, although they might be connected in some ways. So I, I would say they are two different contexts. However, we lack now, I think, a more kind of a personal leadership that moves the country forward and in some ways make us believe that reconciliation is something in fact possible. Thank you. The next question asks, is peace possible in Colombia and what will be necessary for this possibility in Colombia? Again, that was a question that I, somebody raised yesterday and has two answers for me. One is that I hope that uh, you know arms be, may be laid down. That would be peace in some ways, of course. It's better to not to have arms instead of having them. Although I don't think necessarily that by demobilizing guerrillas is going to be a laying down of arms. The other one, the other topic is that peace is not only guns and bullets. Peace is also his justice, social justice, and I wonder if after this process ends, we will have a measure of social justice even in 10 years or so. And in that point, I tend to be rather pessimistic, I have to say. So it has a double, double edge to the question. So the next question uh, came from Twitter and it reads, is domestication a valid argument for leaders who abuse their power? Is domestication, I have no idea, this is another topic. Uh, is domestication a valid argument for? Leaders who abuse their power. I don't really understand. Then pass to the next one. Alejandro, the next question reads, what would you recommend as an alternative process of capturing and preserving information about historical injustice and, quote, illusions about the future that is less prone to silencing those historical injustices? That is what, I'm sorry? That is less prone to silencing the historical injustices. Well, I think, uh, in general, I believe that the country still has to go a long process of historical reconstruction. And in fact, I'm writing right now a piece of paper, a piece, an article which is going to be published in Argentina next month on the idea of a truth commission in Colombia. I have been a critic, I, I, I have been a, let's say a critic rather, of uh, certain mechanisms, but I understand that there is a necessity to do that now. And the only way perhaps it's to imagine a different, a different kind of, of uh, investigation commission that includes precisely these kinds of topics, these kinds of uh, conceptions of harm, these kinds of um, uh, conceptions of violence, et cetera, et cetera, in a different way. So still, my sense is that despite the fact that we have had over the last years quite a lot of initiatives related to history and memory, it seems to me that we still have to grapple with a quite a lot of events and uh, deeds in the last decades that had happened in the last decades. I mean, there is a need for historical clarification. And that has to be a larger debate than the one we have right now, which is very institutionalized. Um, thank you. The next question says, uh, does the Ley de Justicia y Paz take away responsibility from the state and the military? How can the military and the state, state make repar reparations for their role as sponsoring and assisting in paramilitary activity? That's also a complicated question. I have connections with the military people as well. And I have had this conversation with some of them. One of them, in fact, is uh, director of the uh, historical memory unit in the armed forces. And in the last conversation, I told him that the, the, the military in general and the state, of course, in some ways, uh, have to face what had happened over the last 44 decades, that it is impossible that a country moves forward only supposing that the only responsible of conflict and war is only one of the sides. 
conflict in itself requires many sides, or not, I don't know if required, but has different sides. And I think they have to be, of course, they have to deal with that. The problem is that the justice and peace law precisely exonerated the state and the military of the process. That's why I say it is a revisionist law. And this is a very polemic argument in Colombia to say that the peace and justice law is a revisionist one. So it is a revisionist law because in their structure, the state appears as an administrator of justice and not as a perpetrator, let's say. I don't like to use that word, but not as a perpetrator. And in that sense, if we move forward, the, the army would have to face exactly what has happened in the last four decades or so. It makes no sense to remain only as a force of peace, which is not necessarily true. Thank you. The next question reads, how do you maintain the integrity of an experience with the limitations of language, voice, and listening? These testimonies become surgically removed and exploited as examples as a type of epistemic violence for use by the state. Well, I have to say that in that, in that way, my relationship with uh, the people and the communities that I work, it's a, it's a relationship of uh, collaboration. It's a relationship that it, uh, it's, uh, has taken a long time to be built. I have seen other colleagues and other people in other places of the world having perhaps interest in testimonies and interest in the integrity, even in good faith, of course, on the integrity of people. But what happens is that sometimes, and this is a very personal perspective, uh, what happens is that um, sometimes we put in, the, in front our interest as scholars with a particular rhythm of life. We put that in front and we leave behind uh, the, the life and the integrity of the life of these people. So, and that happened to me speci specifically, especially in Colombia a few years ago in South Africa. And I do believe that as a, as, a, as a researcher of these topics, one has to create longer relationships uh, and collaborative relationships as well. It's the only way, I think, in my personal view, that the integrity of people can actually be sustained. Otherwise, I say, and we have spoken of this, how academics, with all due respect, can become also extractors of information, be that testimonies, be that, I don't know, other kinds of information. And communities can actually be very sensitive to that. And unless one changes those practices in the way we research, we tend to, I don't know, re-traumatize, we can use that term, re-traumatize the people that we are working with. So in a way, I'm an advocate, if I can say that. I don't never use that word in this, in this way. Wow. <laughs> I can be an advocate of a more collaborative approach to the story of violence and victimhood in general. Um, the next question says, um, what can be made to make information more reachable for individuals in Colombia so they can be more engaged on building the through? Well, that's complex. The, the, the pages that I read, <clears throat> I'll tell you how I got there. I was one day walking into the district's attorney's office in, in one of the free depositions that I mentioned in the text. And uh, I was trying to listen to one of those sessions because they were close to the public. They were done in, literally in private, although they appear in the lowest public spaces. They weren't. In order to go there, you had to take, you have to surf through the legal system. And as you may know, to, to do that is, can be quite a tricky issue. So in the, in the end, <clears throat> there is a lot of information, but there is also a, it, the, usual, um, the usual difficulties going through the legal systems and the processes and talking to the people. So, so a lot of a lot of Colombians actually criticize how that process was done, how the peace and justice process was done, because although it was presented as a public, in fact, it had too many rituals, too many turns, too many complications, and it is indeed very difficult for someone who is not part of the story to try to get some information out of there. As I say, to get just one CD or one DVD from the district attorney it is almost impossible. You have to befriend. With the, with the district's attorney, with the lawyers, with the bureaucrats in the fiscalia and so on. So I think 
in the future, I guess there has to be somehow that has that material has to be has, has to circulate much more. Has to there has to be other mechanisms to do that. But in, in in the present, also because what was testified by paramilitaries in some ways travels still a lot of people there. There are still interests. There are still financial, economic, political interests. So the voices of these people can be very dangerous to circulate. And some say even that that's why the main paramilitary leaders were extradited to the US, because they could speak about the connection between paramilitarism and politics. And as they were extradited here, that process of truth, uh, truth seeking was in a way broken down. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. The next question reads, doesn't extreme violence tend to make smaller crimes insignificant? How can the justice and peace law differentiate these acts? Mm. One of the complexities when I have to speak is to translate, number one, all the terminology, the legal terminology, and number two is to take a very broad topic and to put it into very small details. The, 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 the irony of the, peace pro of the justice and peace process I get confused now. The irony of the justice and peace process is that it actually produced a lot of little crimes. In fact, the, the mass violations of human rights weren't taken into consideration seriously because as, as the paramilitaries had the will to speak, they would speak whatever they wanted, and they would, in any case, they would never recognize their own violations of human rights. So in the end, it's thousands and thousands of gigabytes of little crimes, of course, many other massacres and so on that you spoke about, but the majority of the information is theft, is lesser crimes, not the crimes of humanity. No one, none of them, I mean, except for some cases, would actually recognize the massivity of their, of the, of what they did. So it's quite the opposite. Um, the next question uh, is, the recent presidential election show how divided the country is regarding the peace process, as it is being currently conducted. Can the process of reconciliation be actually divisive? I'm sorry, say that again, last part. Can the process of reconciliation be actually divisive? Divisive. Divisive. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think so. I think that in Colombia there is people. There are people who still have a. I mean, after 50 years, we can say that war is a good business, and uh, there are people who would in be interested in continuing the situation, maybe maybe because they were connected to the same war situation before, and they'd rather continue like that in order not to be judged, for example. Or because in itself, as I was saying, war is a good uh, business, and therefore uh, uh, it better it better that way. I mean, as long as it doesn't really take uh, uh, as as long as it's as long as it's a good business, there would be perceptions of of the pro of the process as as something that is not positive. But the reason why it's so divisive is because it, I think there hasn't been enough information in the end. I mean, so for some people, uh, exaggerating, of course, they would say that what is happening in Cuba is that they are breaking down, you know, you take this money, I take this money, I'm the government, you are guerrillas, uh, you know, kind of a negotiation in the commercial sense, perhaps. So this is the, this is the view of some people, but I have to say that the people who views that conflict, that particular process with the skepticism, tend to be more to the right than to the left, I have to say. So whatever that means, because that's kind of a tricky opposition, of course. So, so it is divisive. Again, coming back to the topic of before, I think it requires a kind of le different leadership that moves skepticism in another different direction. And that's, that is what I think is lacking now, although I, my sense is that the process has come to a point in which it's very difficult to turn back but you never know. 1992, we were talking yesterday with Jasir, the boycott tank massacre in the middle of the process in, in South Africa, and how that massacre actually almost breaks that process. And it didn't, because somebody took the country in their hands and moved it to another place. So, so, so yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Thank you. The next question reads, 
Many of our students here at the Ford School will work in violent contexts and with victims, people who have been harmed. What lessons can you share with our students? My God. It's a simple question, I know. Sorry. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough question. And it's interesting to um, engagement. I would say lo long engagements, the commitment to historical understanding, the commitment that uh, people, we deal with people, we don't deal with academia, with numbers, statistics, policies. Policies is, of course, policies is people as well. So I would, I would place people before, and I would try to, to understand and that this, the presence of, the, of, of human beings informs the way I do my work, informs the way I speak in public, informs the risks that I take when I do speak in public, not here, but in other places. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I would put that in front. I think that's the most important. That's what I, would, that's what I teach my students as well. And uh, uh, yeah, people is first and then statistics later, perhaps. Thank you. The next question um, is how, if at all, does um, there exist solidarity among the indigenous communities in Colombia, both intra and internationally? And um, as an es explanation, the person say, I'm imagining solidarity resistance to the silencing you discuss. Mm. There are indeed social movements around indigenous communities, Afro-Colombian communities. They are, in, in the end, also, I, they are also highly politicized. They are broken down. They have moved around. I mean, something that one has to take into consideration is that all the future development projects, for example, with regard to petroleum, to gas, to you know, strategic minerals, many of them will be happening in indigenous territories. So they are, in a way, becoming kind of a unnecessary in those territories also. So there is an internal uh, pugna, an internal conflict among indigenous communities to how to relate to those future processes, how to relate to the so-called post-conflict economy, which in the end is an economy, in my sense, I don't know, this is, I might be mistaken here, but in, in the end is going to be an economy based on the expropriations of lands as well. So there is resistance, and there are a lot of communities who are in fact rethinking the connection with the state due precis precisely to that. And I think there is a lot of work to be done in that particular topic, and uh, on the topic of how indigenous communities relate to the state in the context of a post-conflict economy. And the post-conflict economy is an economy that is going to produce more poverty. That's my sense. And I find that prof profoundly ironical, if that, yeah. I think we have time for two more questions. Um, and as you can see, sorting out these questions is challenging in, in, in and of itself. Given your experience, what do you see as the most formidable challenge to adapting truth and reconciliation commissions in contexts where there have been historical violence? Context, for example, like the US as well, where there's a discussion and in, in many parts of, con uh, of the country uh, on the possible application to questions of historical injustice, reparations in the context of slavery, reparations in the context of indigenous rights movements. Yeah, is it adaptable? Can a, a truth commission be of value in addressing issues such as that. Mm. And, th and that's the second last question. OK. The, I think it's a step forward instead of not having one. It, it, let's say 
I speak from the perspective of someone who is living in, at this particular time juncture in, in Colombia. And I ask myself, should we have a truth commission after years in case, even myself is that case, of criticizing this, the, the schemes, the, the structures, the theoretical architectures of that? And I have some work on that. And you know, facing the, the future, I think they are a step in the right direction. What I, what I am more skeptic, skeptic, it's about the idea of the promise that by doing that, we will have a better world. I mean, in some senses, we will, because it will be a mechanism to change at least some part of, 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 uh, of the circumstances. But to, pro but to promise that that would be a radical change, that to promise that we will, like in South Africa many years ago, that we will overcome uh, historical inequality by applying TJ, TJ or transitional justice mechanisms like a truth commission, I think is, an, to be honest, an exaggeration. And it would have to be a TJ, in fact, Transitional justice, I don't like that. I prefer rather transformative justice, something more along the lines of what you're asking. Uh, but I think to put that uh, promise or to put that uh, such an expectation of that on that promise, I think is an exaggeration. <coughs> and it would require, and this is what I'm writing now precisely as part of the peace process, it would require a kind of reconceptualization of what truth and seeking processes really mean. And there is a lot of debate there. Of course, some would rather stick to the model, to the official international model, instead of going into the complicated topics of who is in power, who is, uh, where are wealth, how is wealth distributed, how is it connected with the past, and of course, with the future. In South Africa, we knew perfectly that in the end, the negotiation process was really about politics. And you had, I remember, you had the expectation, or not you, but South Africans I met, had the expectation that by changing the structure of the state and by changing the political process, of course, issues of, his, of social justice would be resolved. And uh, now that I'm going to South Africa in November, I'm quite interested to see how, what happened. And my sense is that it didn't really happen, you know? So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question um, is, what would be the most important challenge of Colombia if the government signed the peace agreement with the FARC? That's an interesting question, too. Um, <clears throat> I often refer to the idea of what is most complicated for us and for societies that have been under, um, in, under conflicts for many years is to imagine a society without conflict. Uh, I, I was saying yesterday, or maybe this morning to a group of students, I was telling them that uh, my second, as a country, as a nation, my second, last, my last name is political conflict. Whenever I speak, I say, I'm from Colombia, and of course everybody knows political conflict, drug, drug dealers, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way that term, political conflict, is now somehow engraved in our identity. Somehow we've been speaking of this topic for 50 years now. It is impossible to think out of the idea of Colombia without a conflict. So for me, the challenge after that, I mean, we can speak of many other more pragmatical challenges, of course. Uh, but for me, the real one, but more philosophical, if I may say that, is the very conception of Colombia without conflict. And that is so unimaginable that nobody really understands what we mean as a society if the peace processes finally conclude. The other is, of course, a certain, a certain idea of thinking that by signing, all these things are going to disappear, that poverty is going to disappear, that violence is going to disappear. That is not the case, and it will not happen. It's going to mutate. It's going to be transformed again. And that is going to be, in a more pragmatical way, the great challenge of that country. I think so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Those were very candid and insightful comments. 
I would also like to thank our audience for such a wide range of thoughtful questions, um, both those who are here and those who uh, sent via Twitter. Um, I'd like to encourage you to join us for future policy talks, and in particular, let me highlight our keynote event on um, October 31st as part of our centennial reunion. We will be featuring Freakonomics author Steve Levitt. You will need seating passes for that event, and I encourage you to visit our newly designed webpage, both for information about the October 1st Steve Levitt event, but also about other policy talks that are coming up. And we do have a reception just outside of the Great Hall, and I invite you to stay and continue the conversation. But before we do that, please join me in a final round of applause. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Thank you.